Hello, how are you guys? Despite what she said, I feel like I'm a student. And if you, if you look at where we are all heading, we as, as, as me as a surgeon and many of us physicians, we really have to understand biology. When you become a surgeon, nobody tells you that. We just think you're gonna play with some fun tools. And we realize now that the future is about biology. How do we improve our own biology? So my goal today is to have you leave with perhaps a few tools or terminologies that you didn't come in with because there is no formula. And what I'm hoping to be able to do is to empower you so that as things you know, proceed forward, we all have something. You can process what you're told, ask the right questions. You have some idea of what these words actually mean because they're quite confusing. If you do a Google search for stem cells right now, you will get about 95,000 citations. And if you just look at the orthopedic uh, uh, context, you'll get almost 2,000. That's just for 2020. That is enormous. So, you know, when I put my head in the volcano, it's overwhelming. And that's why whenever I've spoken about this, I always say, if you ask me about this in another six months to a year, it may change because things are continually changing. And so it's important that you have a basic idea of how does all of this work so that you can process what are we gonna do going forward? Because there's a lot of very exciting uh, technologies that are really moving forward. So as I said, I wanna have us all really understand what are we talking about? We all have joint pain somewhere. And we all hear this word osteoarthritis. And osteoarthritis is a chronic disease that's characterized by wearing out of our joints, right? But here's the thing, about 10% of adults over age 60 have some degree of OA, and according to the UN, by 2050, there will be about 40 million people around the world who will be so severely disabled that they're gonna have difficulty with mobility. If you take a minute to think about that, there's a lot of people. So that means we need to kind of sort out where are we going with all of this? So the question really is, are biologic treatments, are they the solution? If we give all of you biologic treatments, is that going to give you a brighter future? Well, if you look at what the celebrity athletes are doing, you'll go, well, look at all these guys are doing it, it must be good. But then all of a sudden you look at all the ads that are out there, but look at the claims that are being made. It'll take away your pain, it'll take away everything, it'll take away your stress. Stop living with chronic pain. You have this new procedure, no surgery is necessary for knee pain getting all of these claims and if you look at this slide in the middle this person went from bone on bone to all of a sudden they got joint cartilage back just with some kind of a biologic treatment is that is that really making any sense well the FDA has jumped in recently in the last couple of years and said hey wait a second stem cell therapies may not be all that they're cracked up to be in fact they've gone out and they've closed down a bunch of places as well too and so the hype of regenerative medicine is that there are thousands of stem cell clinics that are still operating, but most of them are not really physicians. And because they can't give injections, they often hire other people who are uh, extenders to do that. And so if, if you look at Google as a measure of where we're heading, because they're so in touch with all of us, you know, Google does not allow stem cell regenerative medicine ads. So of course now we have ads that say, well, what do you do if Google will, will no longer allow you on there? So you see that this is really uh, there are a lot of things and forces that are out there that are there to help keep us confused. If you look at this too, this perhaps is the biggest part of it, is if you look at what MarketWatch has said we are heading, the global stem cell market will grow about 10% to reach $13 billion by 2026. That is enormous. So it's no wonder that we're being marketed to in such a way. So if we can't understand the problem, we're not gonna be able to solve it. Remember I said my goal here today is to give you some basic tools to sort out what lies ahead. So here is the anatomy of a joint. And you can see there's bone on both ends, there's cartilage on both ends, and there's this pocket of fluid, which is the joint. And this is just a basic, uh, an example so if we look at the knee, which is used a lot in research, you know, the knee joint is there with all the structures to load absorb. If you look, there's a ball-shaped convex structure at the top, 
and a meniscus cushion in the middle, and then a flat bone. And then the shoulder joint has got a ball in a socket, and you, there are tendons and tissues that surround it. And we'll even look a little bit at you know, the muscle tendon unit. We hear these words. Well, we all want to know what a muscle is. And a tendon is what connects the muscle to bone. right? And these are all things over time that can become, become diseased or damaged. Now, this is what a normal meniscus looks like. And this is an arthroscopic video looking at a meniscus. But the question is, and I hear this all the time, doctor, I have a meniscus tear. My physician ordered an MRI, and now when are we going to repair that meniscus? And so I'd ask you, is a meniscus tear just a tear in the meniscus? If you look at the, uh, the, the photo on the left, that is a tear in a meniscus in someone who has a relatively well-preserved joint. On the right, that is a tear in the meniscus in a diseased joint. So this is an unhealthy joint, and the same treatment will not work for both of those. On the one hand, on the left, that may be one that's repaired. But look at this one that's even worse on the right. That is not one you could put every biologic in the world, and you're not going to really make that look like the one on the left. That's really important to understand. So if we go back to what happens when you hurt yourself, okay, whether you're a soccer player or you fall, you bleed. We all know that. When you fall down, then you bleed. And when you bleed out of the blood vessels, come a lot of things. And if we look at what lies in blood, these are the structures and these are the things that you're going to hear about. There's plasma, there's red blood cells, which is what carry oxygen. There are white blood cells, which are our immune system, and there are platelets, which help with clotting. But basically what blood does is it transports to and away from. It transports cells that you need to where they have to go to, and, and, and waste the nutrients that you don't need away from there. So then when we bleed, we release a lot of these structures into the site of injury, including this thing called an MSC, which you're going to hear about later. And so the, st the second step in healing is where all of those structures that are there, they start working. So if the building is on fire, I sound the alarm, which is step one. And then step two is the firemen and the police and the media all start to gather around. And they start to do what they need to do. And that's this stage two. And that sometimes takes days to weeks. And all of these cells get to work to try to repair the area that has been damaged. right? And they lay down some scar. Now, if we start to look at what's in these cells, then we'll see this one right in the middle, which is green and yellow. And that's called a pericyte. And that comes right out of the blood vessel. And that pericyte will, will create this molecule, which is called an MSC, which you're going to hear about. And that MSC will signal to whatever tissue it's at, and it will turn on that body's own ability to heal, and it's going to allow that tissue to gradually repair itself. Okay, that's a vast oversimplification, but hopefully you guys get that. And then what happens in the weeks to months after that is the body will, will slowly remodel the tissues to hopefully regenerate or recreate what you had before. Now again, this is significantly oversimplified, and you can see that diagram here. And you, we also know that not all tissues can regenerate. You know, we all say, oh, I'm getting old. Well, there is an age-related basis to it, but as you're going to hopefully hear, there's a lot more. And what is probably one of the most important takeaways that I'd like everyone to really leave with is the idea of a microenvironment. In every organ we have, there is a microenvironment. And that basically means right now, in all of us, there is a symphony of events that are going on right now. Your blood vessels are dying, new blood vessels are being made. Immune cells are dying, new blood vessels, new immune cells are being made. Your body is cleaning up and working right now, this very second. And so there's a constant balance between breaking down and growth. We walk through the day, we do the things that we do, we create some breakdown, and that night when we sleep, your body grows, or even during the day, your body grows. When all of those things are balanced, everything works out really well. So as Albert Einstein said, we can't solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. Right? Remember that. So this microenvironment and this breakdown versus growth is really important when we're looking at what is the overall treatment strategy. Again, I'm going to say this many times in different ways. If you want to keep your body well, 
then you need to make sure that you're balancing that growth and you're reducing the inflammation, which is the breakdown. That is my whole talk in a nutshell. If any of you just need to leave, now's the time. I've given you the whole talk, okay? So if we improve the microenvironment, that's always good. Does age really matter? I hear this all the time. Oh, I'm getting old. Well, look, I'd rather take this 1965 Aston Martin that James Bond drove on top that's well-maintained than this junky Porsche 911 that Victoria Beckham, Beckham crashed because she didn't take care of it, right? So, so what really matters is how well are you taking care of your microenvironment. So if we look at what are the popular options right now, these are the ones that you will most likely be recommended if you go to see a physician. Modify your activities, do physical therapy, bracing, orthotics, medication, injections, if that doesn't work, then we do an operation. This is basically the, the overall standard of care. Now with physical therapy, you know, we'll be treated with flexibility, with strength, look at functional gains. For therapy to work, it should be strategic. One of my biggest peeves with physical therapy is when someone said, well, I did that for 10 sessions and it didn't work. And I say, well, if you're going to San Diego and you're on the five freeway and it's blocked, you're not just going to stay there for six more hours. You're going to look for another route. So for rehab to work, it needs to be a strategy. That means you have to speak up, give the therapist feedback, they have to pay attention, and you need to modify those things that aren't working and build upon those things that are. What about medications? We're still giving away too much, too many opioids. Look at these numbers. 130 Americans die every day from an opioid overdose. There's been a dramatic increase in using opioids for treating of non-cancer pain. That is not what we should be doing. And it's also worth mentioning, there's no pharmaceutical yet, I would add, that can stop a reverse OA. And the reason it doesn't exist is because the cause of OA is not one thing. As Dr. Dale Bredesen says in his brilliant book on Alzheimer's, if you have 40 holes in your ceiling, you can't plug one of them up and expect the leaking is going to stop. So there's not one product that reverses it. What else do we use? We use cortisone injections, corticosteroids. We hear about these. Well, what do they do? You inject this fluid in your knee, and they lower inflammation. Okay, so you're bringing down the inflammation. However, we know that most of that is eliminated. If we look at the amount that's taken up in your blood, most of that goes away within about 21 days. Okay? And we also know that if you inject that into a shoulder, that there is a toxicity to the tendons in the shoulder. So we don't like that. So for me, at least in my practice, we're, we're a little more reticent to inject this into a shoulder or in any joint where there's tissue that you want to heal because there is an adverse effect. So while inflammation is bad in a worn out joint, in a joint that's trying to heal, or in tissues that are trying to heal, actually inflammation can be good. That's important to remember as well. What about the joint lubrications? Many of us have had these, visco supplementation. There are many different kinds, and they come from birds, bacteria, or humans. They're made in different ways. And they basically lubricate the joint and lower inflammation. But we also know that they have some direct analgesic effects, just on their own, they can bind to receptors that will improve, you, improve your pain. And we've even seen in some surgical procedures they can be protective of the joint. Okay, well, what about biology modifying treatments? This idea of a cell, all of us are made of millions of cells, trillions of cells, right? And these cells produce energy, they make proteins, and as I mentioned before, they have an innate capacity to regenerate. It's really important to understand. And so what would happen if we could harness these cells and we could use them to do what I just said, improve the microenvironment? And that is where the potential and the lure of biologic treatments really lies in being able to help with improving growth and healing as well as lowering inflammation. And these are at the top of the list, but there are so many options and they continue to grow. We've heard about platelet-rich plasma, we hear about stem cells, we hear about amniotic fluid, and then there's signaling cells as well. So what about platelet-rich plasma? With platelet-rich plasma, you, you take some blood and you are essentially concentrating the amount of platelets in that blood, period, that's it. With that said, there are many, many different kinds and they're uh, marketed in many different ways, but that's basically what it is. 
uh, what lies in that platelet-rich plasma. If you remember a few slides ago when I told you what happens when you injure yourself, all of these things are released. And the platelets are one of the cells that help with clotting. Well, they also happen to have all of these proteins inside them that again signal to the cells around that have an, an innate capacity to heal to begin the healing process. So they send out all of these signals that go to lower inflammation and improve growth. And you're going to see the same uh, theme repeated multiple times. We're improving growth and lowering inflammation. And we see them used in many different areas. And so if I were you, I'd want to know, does this work? And so what we find is that we'll get a lot of evidence on both sides. We have this paper that looked at injecting immediately after an injury that showed that it, 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 it may not be useful then. And I would uh, theorize that it's maybe because of what I said. If you're lowering inflammation right after an injury, that may not be what you want if it's a tissue you want to get to heal. And so this may be a bit better later, if at all. However, if you look at all of the information out there on tennis elbow, which is what we call a tendinopathy, that basically means you got, you've got some partial tearing at the outside of your elbow. Overall, we see a thumbs up. It seems that there is improvement based on the other treatments out there. However, one paper showed there's really no difference between using concentrated platelet-rich plasma versus just your own blood. So it seems that there is some value of just the needling that happens when we're, when we're doing an injection. Now what about patella tendon pain, patella tendinopathy? We see this in a lot of jumping athletes as well too. Overall, the data seems to be promising as far as where this is heading, that there may be some value to using this and getting some of our athletes to improve their pain. What about rotator cuffs? Well, with rotator cuff repair, if, if I summarize all the studies that are out there, and a lot of these are, are people who are getting uh, operations, and this is used in conjunction with an operation, it does seem to have some benefit, again, by improving in the signaling to those cells that are already trying to heal. Okay, what about osteoarthritis, which is, uh, I told you, such a huge potential issue? Well, overall, there are studies that go both ways, but it does seem to improve the reduction in pain. And so in this clinical study, they found that if you respond in the first month to PRP, then your response at six months is also quite good. So there has been a lot of interest in why do some people not respond, and I'm going to tell you what I think about that a little bit later. When we compare that to gels, which I mentioned to you earlier, it may work better. There are a lot of studies that show that the platelet-rich plasma seems to work better than viscosupplementation. In fact, this is something I've incorporated in my practice to some degree as well, which is combining them both. When you combine, combine platelet-rich plasma with the gel, the viscosupplementation, it seems that the effects are augmented to improve the microenvironment. And this study showed better outcomes at a year when doing both of those. So what is the, the summary of the PRP human experience? Well, in addition, it seems that there's a placebo effect as well too, so we have to be careful. And because there's so many clinics out there and a bunch of trials, you know, we're, we're seeing that the business is overshooting the demand because we're not perfectly ready for prime time. And we're seeing even newer generations of platelet-rich plasma that are being developed. While the first generations we've discussed will uh, allow factors that are signals to get to the part you want to get to, the newer generations will now also take out those parts you don't want. So you can will ultimately see the day you can customize it to the, to the needs that you have. The concerns we have are, are still fairly minimal. You get a blood draw, it takes a few minutes, you spin it down, minor pain and swelling. It's not ideally FDA approved, so again, most insurances are still not covering these. What about stem cells? So stem cells are in all of our organs. All of you have stem cells in every organ you have. And each organ and each joint you have has stem cells that are specific to that organ. So it's important to remember that. Now, a stem cell can change into many cell, uh, cell types, especially when you're younger. Right? We all know that the younger you are, the more regenerative capacity you have. But, but in, in this discussion, we're going to mainly focus on adult stem cells. And as I mentioned, 
you can get stem cells from every part of your body. But it's important to avoid confusion to recognize that they are all not the same. And again, here are some terminology, here's some terminology I want to just go over. We don't have to dive too deep. But it's important that it just goes through your mind here once. So, you, so when it comes up in a conversation or someone's mentioning it to you, know what these mean. A totipotent stem cell is the kind you're going to find in a, ch in, a, in a very, very young child or in a fetus. That can turn into anything. A pluripotent, multipotent, these are the ones we basically are using. Pluripotent means it can turn into any of the main cell lines, so even things like amniotic fluid, amniotic membrane. That has the ability to, to go into anything. So it's like saying this person could become a fireman or a policeman or a doctor. Multipotent means you turn into any cell type of a single line. So it means I'm going to be a doctor, but I may be a surgeon, and I may be a, 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 an internal medicine physician. Or unipotent will only become one specific cell type. It can only become cartilage. But it's the middle two, are the, uh, those are the ones that we find the most uh, usage of. It's important to also remember what the FDA has uh, made guidelines for. And they are saying if you want to legally use stem cells in America, then you have to minimally manipulate them. And there are a lot of discussions on what exactly that means. But basically, it means take it out and put it back in. And this is why you'll hear a lot of stories about people going to other countries and other islands. Because in theory, if you could take your stem cells out and you could grow them, and you could pick the things that are going to be good for you and inject them back in, then that may be a little bit better. But that no longer becomes legal. And that is why we cannot do that in the United States of America. So another point to bring out is what I mentioned before, is what is an MSC? So there's a guy named Arnold Kaplan who's uh, in Cleveland, and he is a physician scientist, excuse me, he's a, a PhD, and he spent his whole career really trying to figure out what is it about stem cells. And he coined this term medicinal signaling cells because he said and he found if you take a stem cell out, you can grow it and turn it into anything. But if you put it in the body, it won't do that. All it will do is signal to your own organs that have their own resident stem cells on what to do. It's important to understand that. Because when you're injecting a stem cell, it's not turning into other things too. It's simply going to the place that it is honing in on and telling the other cells to do that. And he came up with a, with a very elaborate system where he basically said all of these MSCs start off around the blood vessels. So that is where these signals come from. They're always around blood vessels. And if you look at the diagram on the top, he found that they, this thing called the pericyte, which connects to the blood vessel, comes off and it gradually turns into this thing called an MSC. Right? And that MSC becomes regenerative. And what the medicinal signaling cells do is they create, which he called, they create drugs which will help improve the microenvironment. So they will block bad inflammation. So if you have uh, a, 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 a cut or some bleeding, they will block bacteria from coming in. So they will literally uh, be a defender. Yet at the same time, they will send signals so your body's own stem cells will begin the process of healing. So it's really important to understand. And he found that these are all the roles that that MSC will take on in the body. Primarily growth and lowering inflammation and breakdown. Again, the same theme I mentioned before. And he also went on to again reiterate that MSCs are not stem cells. They're coming from the blood and they're making these drugs, these proteins, that our own uh, organ stem cells need to be able to uh, create a better microenvironment. And so the, the stem cell therapy that we're seeing right now, you're, you're not getting stem cells that are turning into other cells. You're basically injecting signals. With that said, cell therapy has the potential advantage of allowing the tissue to heal more quickly and decreasing inflammation in joints. And where the future may head is whether new tissue can be created. There is a lot of interesting research that is looking into this idea. So where do we use these stem cell or MSCs 
uh, in the body, all over the place. So let's start off with these mesenchymal cells. Well, we take them from the bone marrow. That may be one of the most uh, popular ways of doing that. And if you look at this, we can do this in the office, we can do this at, an, at a surgery center, we can do it in conjunction with the surgery or on its own, but we basically will take some cells from the blood vessels in the bone, we prepare the cells, and then we can inject them. Remember, we can't manipulate them too much. And so here is a sobering fact. After 15 to 20 years of age, the amount of stem cells you can get will drop off. But I don't think it's the 15 to 20 year olds that are running around at the stem cell centers getting the stem cell injections. That's important to know. So do we really need a lot of cells when we're doing these? Because when you take out the stem cells, there are a certain number of cells in those that can actually do something. Well, the good news is a low volume is okay. All you need is a CC or two or three. That's been shown that actually if you get more volume, the amount of stem cells you have in that volume actually goes down. So it's all about the number you get in, the, in, a, short, in a short volume. How do these work? Well, if you apply them directly to cartilage defects, if you think about it, there are signals that they make. What's interesting is even though cartilage has no resident stem cells uh, because they don't have any blood supply, it turns out that when you can apply these MSCs directly to the defects, they will signal the cells deep within the cartilage that are what we call progenitor cells. So they're an early form of cartilage to grow. So in the lab, you can take 60-year-old cartilage cells and you can put some MSCs on them and you can make them grow, which is quite fascinating. And I, I'm, I'm excited to see how we're going to ultimately be able to apply this to all of us. So if you just inject it in the knee joint, they're not as good. Remember, the knee joint is big. You're only getting a CC or two. Are we really getting these cells to go where they need to get to? So the, the theme here is if you want to make a specific tissue, you want to try to get that signal to the tissue that it needs to go to, which is also a thrust of a lot of research that is out there. And so there are many human trials ongoing in this realm. And if we look at tendinopathy, which is what I mentioned before, which is tendon tearing, when we look at the biology of tendon tearing, we've all had aches and pains that are not joint related. We pull something at the gym, we have a, a tennis elbow, and if you look at the biology, it seems that the stem cells in that organ have lost their really ability to turn into normal cells. And again, another interesting uh, uh, fact that we found is that when you utilize these MSCs, you restore the ability of those tendons to differentiate and turn into healthier cells. Rotator cuff tears, there are, are many French uh, authors who've looked at augmenting rotator cuff repairs with these MSCs with quite good results. And so overall, I feel like this is a thumbs up. This is heading in the right direction. And, and my bottom line answer for where are we with the MSCs that are bone marrow related is that they seem to be safe. There is a subjective benefit in the joint. It doesn't appear that you're getting structural cartilage restoration, but it does appear in the setting of some tendon tears that you are getting some healing tendon tissue. What about fat cells? This has really uh, grown a lot in the last several years. Well, all of us have fat, and if you stick a needle in there and you can take some fat out, just like you do with liposuction, then you can find that those uh, adipose-derived cells have the ability to go and, and, and signal other cells and other stem cells in your system to grow. So the harvest sites that we see commonly used abdomen and thigh, we all hear about liposuction, and when you take these out, you have to prepare them and again, take those MSCs so that they will act as signals. Okay, and we, we, have, we, we see with the research that these um, the MSCs from both bone and fat can both promote cartilage growth, as I mentioned. We've also seen some new ways, this paper is out of Stanford, where you can take some of the fat cells from in the knee. So if you have a knee arthroscopy, you can take some of those fat cells. And at Stanford here, they're using it for cartilage repair. So you see this defect inside the knee, and you can inject this little putty that has 
fat-derived stem cells to try to improve the microenvironment of that knee. So how are we doing as far as the knee? The results seem to be heading in the right direction. So the bottom line, again, safe. Results are promising. Many, many studies are still being done. If you look at 2020, just in the United States, if you look at the amount of stem cell trials, there are almost 3,000. So we see there are, there's a lot of work being done. If you just look at stem cells, 156, 24 of those are in California. Right? So there, there is still a lot of work that is, under, that, is, uh, that is happening. Well, what are the concerns? Well, and I'm part of this group called the Biologics Alliance. So all the top orthopedic groups around the world have gotten together to try to figure out how do we make some sense out of this because the public are really being misinformed and how can we proceed forward with some science? And so we see that things are heading in the right direction very, very gradually, but we still don't have a consensus on how to use it. And that is one of the reasons why, if you talk to your friends or if you look online, if you look at the media, why are there so many varying results? Is because there's not one recipe. Right? All of us are, are genetically and, and genetically different and unique, and so it wouldn't make sense that there would be one recipe that would fit all of us. Again, it's fairly safe. There is a varying amount of stem cells that can be harvested that tend to decline with age, still not FDA approved, and still not covered by most insurances. Everybody digesting all that so far? So what about amniotic fluid? Well, this is on the rise now too. There are a lot of studies right now on the use of these amniotic derived tissues. Well, all of us know what this is. This is what lives around the baby. Well, if you think about what does a baby need to grow, well, they need everything. So they need those totipotent stem cells. They need to be able to grow into anything. Every uh, small region of a baby needs to get bigger. So if you, uh, if you imagine what the potential of that tissue or cells would have, it's, it's, it's an enormous. And so if you compare the amount of growth factors and the signals to other types of cell treatment, this may be on top. It may be one of the richest sources of growth factors that are out there. It's about 4,000 more than adipose and about 100 times more than the bone marrow that I mentioned to you. And it, and it even seems to be superior to the fat-derived stem cells for helping with our joints in some of the animal, cell, animal studies that have been done so far. And there are some human studies going on as well too. But the bottom line is this is still fairly early because all of us who are looking at this realm are kind of tiptoeing in there, so we're making sure we're doing these studies the right way. So the bottom line is it seems to be promising and it's safe. Again, I'm repeating the same thing. Well, what about future directions? Well, here's one of the things that actually to me is quite fascinating and interesting because all of you right now could do this tomorrow with things that you buy on Amazon. And the idea is that as our cells age, there is a word that's called senescence. That means our cells get older and they stop functioning. So it's like the grumpy old worker who's in the office that's not, that doesn't have the productivity of everybody else, right? Except the body has a way to deal with that. It's called senolysis. So the body will gradually clean up those cells. And it turns out that if you look at models of arthritis, if you can increase the senolysis, if you can take away those cells that are dying away, then you can improve the microenvironment immediately. And so if you look at things that are out there, like this one called Fisetin, as I said, this is being studied right now in the Department of Defense funded clinical trial that's happening in Vail to delay osteoarthritis. They're looking at 40 patients at these doses and their goal is to delay osteoarthritis progression because they're utilizing some basic science data that when you take these sort of uh, Seton compounds that you can increase the, uh, the, the, the clearing away of some of those cells that aren't doing their job. There's a lot of super fascinating and extraordinarily confusing uh, other types of uh, treatments that are really out there when we're using genetic modifications to try to figure out what genes are involved in tendinopathy. If you have a rotator cuff tear, can we figure out why you are different than you? What is it about you that's different and come up with a biology that will work for each of you individually? And so we also are seeing a lot of 
a media on these things called exosomes, which are again signaling molecules. The problem is again, not legal right now. So all of the research that, are, that is out there is usually under the guise of a clinical trial. We're also seeing that if you really want to get biology to work, that needs to fit the joint. So again, we can see that we can make these 3D uh, defects and we can fill them with whatever biology you want and, and put them into the defect that you have. So the future is quite fascinating. We can even induce these pluripotent, remember there's that word again. That means they can, they can branch out into, into many different kinds of one cell line. But you can take your own stem cells if they're older and you can inject them and you can, you can, you can induce them to become younger. And you can inject them back into cartilage cells and make them young again. This has already been shown in animal models like I mentioned before. What about peripheral blood? There's some research happening with blood and umbilical cord derived stem cells and we have a lot more to go. If you look in the middle of this list, allogeneic stem cells. That may be one of the most popular versions of stem cell therapy out there where you go someplace and they just inject you with allogeneic stem cells. And the problem really is it's the wild, wild west right now. There is no regulation on that. So if I give you uh, if I give each of you something different, I have no idea what's in there because we have no real easy way to test it. So there's a lot more to come, and I think the future is quite exciting. So what can you do right now? Because I want you to at least leave with that. What can I go home and do that is going to improve my own microenvironment? And everyone who knows me is probably sick of hearing me talk about this, um, especially my family. But, but, but optimize your health. Why? Because you're going to do what we just talked about. You will improve your body's own ability to grow and its own level of inflammation. And I would say if any of you who are considering some kind of a biologic treatment, before you do that, get your microenvironment as good as it can be, and then if you're still having issues, then that may be a discussion worth having, right? We all know these, so I'm not telling you something you don't know. Exercise, nutrition, sleep, and stress management. And stress management is really there. It's, it's, it's less about the stress and more about what your body does with it. We all have a fight and flight response and a rest and digest response, but when the fight and flight is there all day, then things just go haywire. Okay, what about exercise? You know, I think the, uh, one of the ones that may not be stressed enough is how important it is to have stability. Are you stable on the ground? Are you stable on one leg? We know about strength, aerobic, and high intensity training, but it's also important when you're doing exercise uh, to, to, to look at different energy systems. So these may be my five big principles on how to exercise because there's not one way to do it. One is to have a goal, don't just do it. Consider what you're doing the, as far as the dosing. This is like medicine. How much are you doing? What are you doing? How much? Figure out what am I looking for and adjust the dose based on your recovery. And this is why a lot of rehab and a lot of exercise programs don't work. Because people just get into a routine, they get bored. When you're bored, again, you're fight and flight. You don't like it. You don't want to do it. And your body is, is really, really smart. If you're doing that, then you're, you're not lowering inflammation. You're, you're, you're changing it in a way that's going to be damaging to you. So that's why I say make it enjoyable. If you're not enjoying it, then you're not lowering that inflammatory response. And keep it, keep it varying so that you're allowing your body to, to learn and grow because your body is a very dynamic organism, right? These are some of the recommendations that are made. I don't want to bore you, but basically be active. And I think if I had to mention one part of the exercise part is this. Learn about stability. You could sit in the chair, stand up from a chair, sit down in a chair, and if you did that 10 times while you're focusing on what is my body doing, just that alone out of nothing else is going to help you with gaining some of the stability. And that, was, that may prevent many injuries as well too. And I'm a huge fan of strength training because of many, many different reasons. When you strength train, you upregulate your own body's uh, stem cell production from each of the organs, and to me that's a good thing as well too. When you do aerobic exercise, you can improve the blood flow, and we know you can improve the strength as well too. So this idea of aging, if you look at a 74-year-old sedentary male, and you compare that to a 70-year-old triathlete, and you look at the MRIs of a thigh muscle compared to a 40-year-old triathlete, they don't look much different because the 70-year-old has really improved his own uh, microenvironment or her own. You know, high-intensity exercise also is quite good because it also allows your body to mobilize its own stem cells. And there are many different variations of this. You were here about Tabata and HIIT training. But the idea is you have this very super intense period where you're asking your body to do something, then you're having a short period of rest, 
and you're continuing doing it that way. And again, these are all ways of jostling your biology to head you towards a better microenvironment. What about nutrition? Each person is unique, and again, there's not one diet that works for everyone. They hear all the time, what about this diet? What about that diet? And I say, you know, there's, there's not really one way. So again, here are those same principles as applied to nutrition. Have a specific goal. Consider not only what you eat, which is what most everyone will tell you. Calories in, calories out is absolutely wrong. You should never believe that. There's no science behind that. It's also about when you eat and how much you eat, right? Measure and make changes based on your progress. Again, try to make it enjoyable. You know, if, you, if you're eating and you're stressed out, that's not going to put your body in the state that you want it to be in. And vary your routine. So with that said, it turns out that eating real food, you know, vegetable-rich foods and, and healthy meats and healthy, healthy oils are probably the way to go. If you can avoid processed sugars, that's always ideal. You know, I was listening to a, uh, an interview with someone who said that um, uh, uh, historically, humans had about 600 different varieties of vegetables and it took about 100 grams of, of fiber in a day and right now we're all as Americans probably taking less than a tenth of that and so it's no wonder where we're heading right so what about this idea of fasting well you know fasting when you first uh, approach it sounds kind of horrifying like when am, why would I want to do that like why would anybody not want to eat but it turns out that when you're not eating your body's cleaning up those senescent cells and the most fascinating thing is when you fast for a prolonged period of time, if you look at some of the, the evidence on cancer patients, after 36 hours, your body's under stress. So when you refeed, then it reboots and it increases uh, a substantial amount of stem cell production in all of your organs. And in the setting of cancer, cancer needs sugar. And when you break it down first and you allow the rest of your body to, to survive, you'll see why there's a, a, a big, a, a, there's, a popul there's a popularity to this idea in that world. What about sleep? You know, when you, when you sleep also, that is where a, a lot of important hormonal activity occurs, and that is where a lot of the, uh, the background of our own body stem cell production is also uh, improved. What about water? You definitely need to drink a lot of water. I hear all the time, what supplements should I take? And I tell people, look, do all the other things first. Let's not talk about supplementation. As tempting it is, as it is to have one, uh, one pill that's going to fix my problems, that's not the way the body works. As I showed you, there are multiple factors at work. So it won't substitute uh, for poor nutrition. However, with that said, all of us should be taking these. Fish oils are very brain healthy. They're very joint protective. And it seems that they can improve the way our genes are expressed and, and even uh, improve our stem cell number when we're looking at vitamin D3. So what about biologics? You know, when do I use biologics in my practice? So I'll always consider what part of the body is injured. Is this an acute injury? Is this a chronic injury? And then we try to really find a treatment plan. And so you should always ask your physician, how does this plan apply to me? And make sure that you are allowing your goals to be heard so your physician understands what is it that you want and what is it that makes you specific to you, right? And so with that said, how do I use platelet-rich plasma? Well, I'm currently using an osteoarthritis and if we have to go the medication route, I'll, I'll occasionally use uh, cortisone injections, we'll occasionally use visco supplementation. And when I use platelet-rich plasma, we have a similar but briefer discussion of what we just discussed. We'll use three injections over three weeks because there are a lot of papers that support that being used. And we've begun combining that with visco supplementation because we're finding that the results are, uh, seem to be synergistic. And we've occasionally used it in uh, conjunction with complex knee surgeries. Where we're really trying to improve the microenvironment inside. We'll, we'll use it in tendon problems as well too and for chronic muscle tears. What about cell therapy, right, the MSCs? So these tend to work better in less severe uh, joint wear, smaller cartilage defects. In my practice, I'm probably using it a little bit more uh, in conjunction with surgical treatment because right now I don't think ethically it's appropriate based on the data that I know. I should tell people you should be getting this firsthand. I think the platelet-rich plasma is much more cost-effective as a first line to be used in the office. Um, amniotic fluid, there. There's a lot of information out there that's anecdotal about teams that are using these. These are, these are used, uh, being used more and more and more. I, I think it's very promising 
on what it can do in osteoarthritis. What's interesting about it is you don't have to take anything from you. You can just inject it in there. And because of what we know about amniotic fluid, I think um, I'm excited to see uh, where that's going to go because that might even work better uh, than PRP or even better with the PRP. So as I mentioned, uh, and it seems like I've repeated the same theme, these biologic treatments, whether you are behind it or a physician is behind it, are working by improving your own internal biology. So just leave with that. If you can improve your biology, your steps in the right direction. There's a lot of promise with the clinical studies that are, uh, that are out there. And the FDA is trying to manage things. And to their credit, they're now shutting down a lot of the stem cell centers that are making uh, false claims. And they're going after them, which is a good thing. So we'll see less now. But we're still, because of what I told you, where this business is heading, you're still seeing a lot of stem cell centers that are out there and they're making some of these uh, false claims. And I think part of that is because it's not insurance covered. Whereas PRP, uh, uh, costs and treatments are on the order of hundreds, the stem cells are on the order of thousands, and that's why we're seeing lots and lots of stem cell centers that are out there. So I, I hope I've given you a few tools to use to be able to ask your physicians uh, how you can be best treated. So thank you very much for listening.